Welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles and also sponsored by the Political Science Department, the Urban Studies Department, Chicana, Chicano Studies Department, American Cultures, and a variety of other uh, units throughout the university. This is the 10th anniversary of the lecture series, and I'm very excited about tonight. Uh, typically, we have uh, many speakers who talk about the conventional uh, politics of uh, what's going on in Los Angeles. Today, we're going to talk about the, uh, the duality of Los Angeles and the, all the type of mobilizing that's occurring that is sometimes invisible, although increasingly covered by the press and certainly covered by scholars. And we have three scholars today that are going to talk to us about the new emerging organizing communities. Uh, we have with us uh, uh, next to me Victor Naro. He is project director of the uh, UCLA Labor Center. And we're going to talk about labor centers and, and what those are and how few there are compared to business schools, which is uh, something that just about every university has. Uh, he has been involved with immigrant rights and labor issues for many years. At the UCLA Downtown Labor Center, his focus is to provide leadership programs for LA immigrant workers, internship opportunities for uh, UCLA students. Victor is also a lecturer for the Chicana Chicano Studies Department, where he teaches classes that focus on immigrant workers and the labor movement. He was formerly co-director, excuse me, co-executive director of Sweatshop Watch, and we'll ask him what that's all about. Prior to that, he was the Workers' Right Project Director for the Coalition for Human Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, uh, known as CHURLA to many of us, where he was involved with organizing day laborers, domestic workers, garment workers, and gardeners, groups that are increasingly difficult to mobilize because of the nature of their work and how uh, uh, dispersed they tend to be. Uh, with work in multi-ethnic organizing led to the creation of the Multi-Ethnic Immigrant Workers Organizing Network in collaboration with the Garment Worker Center and the Filipino Worker Center. Through Victor's leadership, the Day Labor Project was able to grow into the National Day Labor Center, or excuse me, the National Day Labor Organizing Network that today includes 40 community-based worker centers from around the country. Over the past few years, Victor has worked with the LA labor movement on major immigrant working worker organizing campaigns with janitors, hotel workers, laundry workers, sanitation workers, port truckers, and more recently, car wa the car wash campaign. And that's been very recent and going on right now, and we'll have some discussion about that. Uh, if it's difficult to organize, Victor is there. And so um, we, whatever you want to organize, v Victor can do it. Victor is co-author of uh, broken Laws, Unprotected Workers, Violations of Employment and Labor Laws in American Cities, and Wage Theft and Workplace Violations in Los Angeles. He's also co-editor of a recent book, Working for Justice, the LA Model of Organizing and Advocacy. And this is actually what we're going to be talking about. I have the book right here. I have uh, my students are reading it in, in their class. And for those of you who are interested, we brought extra copies if you want to buy them at a discount. More on that in a, at the end of the uh, lecture. Recently, the mayor appointed Victor to a seat on the board of commissioners of uh, the Community Redevelopment Agency. Now, have you been approved by the council? Next week. Next week. Okay, we'll be watching that because I think there's going to be some people who think you're a little too radical to be on any conventional uh, political uh, board. In addition, we've talked in, in this class about the Community Redevelopment Agency and how it's probably going to be disbanded. So the mayor appoints him to a board and then the governor gets rid of it the very next uh, month. So <laughs> typical for a, a community activist. Uh, Victor Naro, uh, a, a good friend, a great organizer, and a great resource for Los Angeles. Victor. Uh, Next to him is Karina Muniz. She's Community Outreach Coordinator for the Los Angeles Conservancy in partnership with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She holds a master's degree in urban planning and Latin American studies from UCLA and has worked as an advocate and researcher on issues such as international fair trade, low-wage immigrant work, worker organizing, gender rights, and transnational civic participation. As community outreach coordinator, Karina works to broaden the 
scope of historic preservation so that it reflects and restores the urban social history of Latinas and Latinos within the cultural landscape and architectural heritage of Los Angeles. She works in partnership with community leaders to bridge race, class, and gender disconnects with historic neighborhoods by increasing public awareness and expanding resources and opportunities available to residents. She is also a co-author of one of the, or excuse me, an author of one of the chapters that's in this book. And, and in addition, we've talked about how many, um, in class, we've talked about how many of the uh, um, uh, environmental or historic preservation groups have been very centered in terms of affluent communities, very white communities, and this is, she, one of her main goals is to try to bridge that gap. So, Karina Muñiz, thank you for coming. And last but not least, at least not yet, we'll figure that out at the end, is Joshua Bloom. He's a doctoral candidate in sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles. You're getting the he instinct here about UCLA, UCLA, UCLA. And clearly because of, well, I'll talk about that in a second, about why that, that, uh, that, that is happening here in Los Angeles. Uh, Joshua is the former director of Social Movements Project at the Institute for the Study of Social Change at UC Berkeley. He is the co-editor, uh, along with Victor and Ruth Milkman, who was at UCLA, but they got rid of her. She went to Columbia or NYU, I forget. City yeah. oh, City University of New York. Okay, she is, um, excuse me, Joshua, uh, besides being a co-editor of this book, is also the uh, a, a author, first author of a book called Black Against Empire, The Rise and Fall of the Black Panther Party. And it's currently under review to, for publication by the University of California Press and Harvard University Press. His current projects include Pathways of Insurgency, Black Liberation Struggles, and the Second Reconstruction in the United States, 1949 to 75, and Analyze to Win, the Crucial Role of Research for Building Worker Power in Neoliberal Economies. Um, he's co-author of that. Before returning to academia, he worked eight years as a full-time organizer, predominantly in public housing housing communities. So what you have here are three individuals who are not only scholars, but they're activists. And not only activists in the way that I sometimes call myself an activist, but these people are actually doing things. I make a couple of phone calls here and there. They're, they're actually out there in the streets working with some of the most underprivileged sectors of our society. And it's really reflective in terms of what's been happening with, with Los Angeles. Just before we got here, in terms of my class, we were talking about dual LA, how there almost seems to be two societies in Los Angeles, both politically, economically, and socially. Uh, politically, there's the conventional political power that, uh, Victor, now you're getting into in terms of the CRA, but also the unconventional political power where this book really discusses. So we talked about the UCLA connection. Um, Victor, why don't you talk a little bit about why UCLA, what's the worker center, um, and the origins of this book, and then we'll get Joshua in here to some extent. So. UCLA, the Labor Center, and this book. Okay, well, I've been with the Labor Center, UCLA Labor Center for the past seven years, and that's allowed me to connect um, the uh, resources in the way of students and academics and researchers at UCLA uh, to infuse them into the work of uh, social justice, especially with dealing with worker justice in Los Angeles. What's unique about the Labor Center is not only are we the only labor studies program, um, in the California University system. There's a, a Berkeley Labor Center as well. Um, but the, apart from the Berkeley and UCLA Labor Center, there's no other labor studies program. We also have the benefit of having a downtown community uh, space, the downtown labor center, which is a, a space that's owned by a union, uh, United HERE, but they lease a space to us. So we've been, uh, been able to use uh, UCLA resources in the way of student internships, uh, academics, and also uh, graduate students and researchers to, uh, to connect them with different parts of the labor movement. And before coming to the Labor Center, I was very much involved with um, most of the organizations featured in this book. I, you know, I worked at Chilla, I created the Gama Worker Center, I helped create the Pilipino Worker Center, I worked in the creation of the Multi-Ethnic Immigrant Workers Organizer Network. Uh, when MCTF was formed, uh, I was part of the planning process to figure out what would be the um, the implementation of MCTF. 
And then, um, you know, my work with day laborers and domestic workers, you know, working here in Los Angeles, working with great organizers led to national models. Today we have the National Day Labor Organizing Network and the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which is pushing forward good policy initiatives to protect the rights of domestic workers and day laborers. And um, I've been fortunate, you know, a lot of my work has just been at the right place at the right time. I've been fortunate, that, you know, when I came to Los Angeles to work in 1992, after I graduated from law school, my first case at the Mexican American Legal Defense Educational Fund was helping day laborers win their right to look for work at, at, at street corners. And that kind of led my whole trajectory into getting involved with low wage workers. It was around the 1990s, too, that we saw the emergence of worker centers. So some of the worker centers featured in this book, like Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance and the Government Worker Center, Polybona Worker Center, MCTF. Uh, there was part of a massive movement of the emergency. But explain, what is a worker center? A worker center is a, it's a community-based effort to organize or empower a group of workers that have been really left outside of the uh, radar screen of union organizing for many reasons because it's hard, it, these are like the hard to reach uh, of the workforce. And so these worker centers emerged to, to try to uh, win justice for these workers either through um, addressing labor violations or getting these workers involved in campaigns. And the last few years, we've seen the uh, connection between worker centers and labor unions. I think that more, more labor unions are starting to look at the uniqueness of these worker centers as a good model for organizing, but also how to join alliances with them. And but a worker center is a physical space where workers also come to. Yeah, it's a physical space. Uh, most worker centers have their own collective space where workers can come and gather and, and strategize and also participate in organizing efforts. Um, so the labor center through UCLA, through the folks like uh, uh, you know Josh and uh, Karina when she was a graduate student, it's allowed me to connect the movement to um, those kind of resources and to improve you know, the, the quality of the work that we do for worker justice, either in the way of research development, uh, leadership development, and also campaign development. So I feel we were uniquely situated to kind of really take UCLA resources and channel them into the labor movement, into the immigrant workers' uh, rights movement, and also into the um, uh, movement of creating these worker centers. Now, you, you know, when you first started here in L.A. in 1992, we obviously had the riots, but there, there was a resistance by the unions to these worker centers, and, and I wouldn't want to say worker rights, but in terms of them expressing or, or even the unions helping them organize. Why was that? I think there was a lack of understanding by labor movement about this emerging workforce, uh, take day laborers, for example, uh, back in 1992, 1993. So most of this, you guys know what day laborers are? I mean, day laborers, uh, we all seen, uh, every, every time we have a home improvement store, like a Home Depot, you see uh, a congregation of workers at, at those uh, corners near the uh, improvement stores or paint stores where they stand around and look for work and wait for employees to pick them up. We have some day labor worker centers now in Los Angeles, we have nine of them, but for the most, Day laborers are at major street corners, intersection where you have a home improvement store or a paint store, and there's been an attempt to organize them um, with the help of many worker centers. Back in 1990s, uh, 19, early 1990s, when we started organizing day laborers, the, the strongest opposition we had to that kind of uh, attempt to organize them were by uh, construction trades unions because they saw day laborers as a threat to their um, ability to. Uh, um, to uh, unionize workers, but also to uh, to get construction companies to um, to sign labor agreements with them, and so they saw day laborers as um, um, uh, a way to uh, und undermine what they were trying to do to improve labor standards. So, so in other words, if you legitimize the day laborers, then they someone could hire them and not hire union workers, and it would undermine the wages and the benefits that the unions had. That was the That the was the argument. Theory. So it took many years of surveys. You know, we had academic surveys done through UCLA, national surveys, where we showed that the majority of employers are day laborers are not construction companies. There's some, con some contractors who hire them, but for the most part, they're private homeowners. And they send out, they, they get hired to do work in people's home, home improvement. So I think over a period of time, it, it, it took a, a period of years to educate the, um, the construction trades union that worker centers, if anything, uh, improve the labor standards for day laborers, which actually benefits them in the long run because we 
we lift the ceiling for uh, that part of the workforce. And, and we can be strategically, we can go after those contractors that unions don't want in the city to begin with. So um, Joshua, tell us, uh, I mean, we talked about why UCLA, uh, why, why Los Angeles and why this book? Good evening to the folks here, and um, I want to thank uh, Fernando Guerra and also Nancy for organizing this event. Um, we, we like to organize free labor. <laughs> That's right, free labor. Um, we're, we're glad to be able to talk about this book. We think this is an important book. Um, let me tell you a little bit about sort of how it came together and why I think it's an important book. But before I do, I want to ask you a couple questions so I know better who I'm talking to. Um, who here is a student at LMU? Okay, and um, who here is not a student at LMU? Um, and who here has either been an activist or an organizer on a social justice issue? Okay. Um, basically, um, you know, I think we're very privileged to be here um, at UCLA in Los Angeles um, and getting Actually, to do... We're, we're at Loyola Marymount. Yes, but uh, writing the book. <laughs> we're privileged to be here talking with you. We're, we were privileged in putting the book together to be at UCLA um, because of the connection with the Labor Center and with um, a real ferment of um, workers building worker power um, in Los Angeles. Um, to put the project in some sort of very broad perspective and then hone in a little bit on what we were trying to accomplish, um, Private sector union density, the number, sort of the percentage of workers in the private sector who are unionized, used to be well over a third um, in the late 40s, and it's now gone down under 7%. So whereas organized labor, whereas unions really set the pace for the character and the quality of the employment relationship and had a major role in setting public policy as well, um, worker power has really been drastically eroded over the last um, 50 years. And um, that trend has been um, bucked in a few places. There's been some resistance and some new challenges and ways of workers trying to build power. And LA has really been probably the epicenter of those challenges. And, and what we're blessed to be able to do in, in putting this project together was to work with some of the folks like Victor and Kent and some of the, the actual organizers on the ground. Kent Wong, who's also affiliated with uh, the UCLA Labor Center. Very That's right. prominent individual. Um, and they were able to bring um, to the project um, uh, a real engagement with um, the individuals on the ground who are finding new ways of fighting for worker power and building worker power. And what um, a group of us at UCLA did, you know, people say that you've, you've probably all heard um, knowledge is power, right? But what kind of power? And, and no uh, offense here <laughs> to Professor Guerra, and, you know, but oftentimes, and I'm sure this is, uh, his classes are exceptional, but oftentimes the, the role of the university is to reproduce the prevailing power arrangements, right? Is to reproduce the knowledge and the ways of thinking that help shape individuals that will go on to um, play social roles as they're constituted, right? To, to embrace the understanding of the world and to remake the world. Um, and, and, and who gets to set the curriculum? And who gets to, to decide what books are taught? And on what basis? And what's the intellectual framework that imbues those books? So we really wanted to try to sort of intentionally have a different kind of role in producing this book. Um, you know, if you look at the peer review processes at the top academic presses, you know, it's the, it's the professors and the gatekeepers who are imbued in and have developed and learned from the kinds of ideas that have constituted the society and the power relations as they are, they get to decide what gets to get published. And we, we really work to try to make this a different kind of book, um, to try to set up the questions and to try to set up an analysis that would be relevant to workers trying to challenge those prevailing relations, trying to get out of the trap of um, the lack of, of, of unionization, the lack of worker power. And so we set up the book 
um, as a series of case studies looking at 12 successful campaigns in Los Angeles in recent years where workers had fought successfully and won some measure of power, whether it was unionization or a policy gain or another gain. And what we did in each of those projects was we matched academics with activists and leaders of those campaigns to set up the the questions and the frameworks that would um, be studied. And then we used the best resources that we had at the university to ask those questions in a rigorous way. So you chose the campaigns because they were successful. That's and right. One, you chose the, um, the authors because, and we'll get to Karina in a second and how she got involved, but generally the authors that were just at UCLA or they were knowledgeable already about these areas or these campaigns. Yes. The, 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 the scholars who we chose were interested in these, they were clearly interested. So we didn't want to drag somebody into sort of writing about these things that wasn't interested. It was a question of folks who were interested in these, in these struggles um, and had some expertise and capacity to do analysis, but were really interested in working with the activists and the leaders of the campaign on the ground. And then, well, let me, let me ask, uh, Karina, how did you get involved? Why did you get involved? And then talk about the process that you took in terms of um, researching and, and working collaborative, not just with scholars, but with also with activists. Um, I guess thinking back right now when Victor was talking, how I originally got involved uh, to a certain degree is um, I, I used to work for the San Francisco Day Labor Program. And I met Victor at the first Ending Long Conference back in 2001. Um, and being in San Francisco, doing organizing out there, I got a real sense of sort of the, the pace setting that Los Angeles was um, as a city in terms of the organizing that was happening. Um, and then in 05, when I moved to LA to study urban planning and Latin American studies, I worked for the Center for the Study of Urban Poverty under Professor Valenzuela. Um, and we worked directly with MCTF, the Maintenance Corporation Trust Fund, which is a chapter in this book um, that I wrote about. Um, to really go in, we ended up interviewing 100 and different, 105 different janitors throughout um, LA County in different non-union supermarkets. So that meant we went to Superior, we went to Food for Less, we went to Bristol Farms, um, and we wanted to get a sense uh, from the workers themselves what were the labor conditions in, in these supermarkets. You know, what, um, what were the conditions? Were they getting paid overtime? Were they not? Were they getting breaks? What were the health and safety issues? So doing that work and working with the students and working directly with MCTF gave me a sense of what was happening on this scale. I mean, you mentioned the duality. I think I got a clear picture of this duality because we were going there four in the morning, five in the morning, trying to talk to workers when they got out of, of working a shift. And most people here in LA are sleeping at that time, right? You have, you have a, it's almost like an invisible labor that continues to happen. We wake up, we go into the supermarkets, they're clean, the produce is fresh, you know, you don't really get a sense of what are the workers that are making all of this happen and what types of conditions did they come from to the, in the first place and what types of conditions are they working in now? So um, I was doing that work, I already had a, a relationship with Lilia, um, who's the executive director of Maintenance Corporation Trust Fund. Two of her staff came on board to help us interview. We did trainings with students on how to approach janitors, um, how to be, you know, how to understand, how to talk to them in a way that protects them and also being you know, very culturally sensitive to what we were asking. Um, and then I was working at the time at the Labor Center as well for the Institute of Social Change Across Borders. So Victor pulled me in and said, hey, you're already doing this work. Can you be a, you know, a student writing this chapter? And, and of course, I said, yes. I mean, it's a huge privilege, I think, for us, as Josh mentioned, as grad students to be able to write about this. Usually, it's you know, the professor or the grad student who does the majority of the work, and the professor kind of signs off on it, right? But we get to be the grad students actually doing this, um, I think, was a huge opportunity for all of us. We would always kid, Victor's being kind of modest, that the title of the book should really be The Life and Times of Victor Nato because he's like in every chapter, he's played a fundamental role. So um, that's somewhat how we got involved. And I think working with, um, I worked, I had lots of meetings with Lilia, lots of meetings with, the, with, with um, the interviews with different workers of MCTF to get a sense from them, you know, how, how is the storytelling happening? Because I was going to also say, I think what's powerful about this book is yes, we make clear arguments on, on, uh, on a theoretical level and it's rigorous research, but it's the storytelling. I think it's really about the people that you read about in this book. Who are they? What are their stories? How did they you know, make, make successful campaigns? And I think without, without those layers of, 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 of stories of the people, you wouldn't get a book as powerful as, as this one. So Victor, Josh, I want you to, Really, I want to communicate to students how 
the labor center at UC Berkeley and UCLA, could they be somewhere else like at, at, at Loyola Marymount University? As a matter of fact, I would think it'd be easier for them to be at a private university than at a public one because I know consistently um, your budgets are, um, UCLA is a public institution, sometimes it gets a lot of its money, though uh, contrary to conventional belief, not all of its money from the state of California, and it's the, constantly your particular unit is under attack by state legislators when they say we shouldn't fund this, yet they fund business schools. So talk about the politics of a labor center, why there aren't more of them, and how we can justify a business school but not a, a labor center. Yeah, <laughs> labor studies program have been always under attack around the country by more like the more conservative forces because uh, really we're about introducing students to labor and workplace issues, especially uh, educating students about the labor movement and unions and why unions are important. And during the Governor uh, Schwarzenegger administration, which has ended, um, we were the only entity, the only department in the whole University of California system that was targeted for elimination, not for decreasing the budget, but targeted for and this is not this is not about the university administration. This was in UCLA. Yeah, it was. It, it, it was the state legislature yeah. and the governor doing yeah. this. Yeah, and um, you know what happened in California? Of course, we, uh, the governor has a line item veto power, which means that once the final budget is given to him, before he signs the budget, can cross out any program before he signs the budget uh, without legislative approval. And you know, we have a lot of Democrats in the legislature who support us and always make sure we were in the final budget. But the Governor Schwarzenegger and his staff will look for us. I mean, we changed our names like three times in the last uh, seven years to try to figure a way to, to keep uh, under the radar screen. And they will always look for us and strike us out of the budget completely before he um, signed the uh, uh, the final budget, and I think it's a lot of. Uh, then how would you stay if he signed you out? Then what? The legislature would ever have, have to overturn it? No, they they can overturn it. So we'll be completely out of the state budget. So the legislature would then pressure the University of California administration to find emergency funding for us within the UC budget. But in the scheme of things, within the University of California system, we're not that important. I mean, the reality is we don't bring the kind of income to the university system as uh, some of the corporate research that the, you know, the business school and other schools do. So we're always less on the priority for the University of California. So the reason why we were able to get back emergency funding was because uh, they were being battled so much by the Democrats in the legislature that you know, they'll consider UC's budget next year, take into consideration whether or not they allow us to have emergency funding. So we've been able to survive on fumes, uh, but we, do, we have been able to get outside resources to private foundations. Um, some support from the labor movement, but mostly to private foundations to subsidize ourselves while we, we, we survive. And I think we have a different climate uh, with Jerry Brown, but that's not the case in other parts of the country. And under Indiana, the labor studies program was wiped out completely because it's a Republican legislature. There was no way that they could survive. So I think this, the attack on labor studies program is, is the conservative argument that taxpayers' money should not be used to pay for educational programs to educate people about the labor movement. Because you don't see the same kind of attack on business schools. That the business schools and University of California during the past few years with the budget crisis have actually grown, the budget for the business schools. And at the same time, they try to wipe out the labor studies program. The, the only existing, I mean, we don't even have a major because we can't even develop ourselves that much. We have a minor program. Um, but we have the only ability for students to be, get connected to the labor movement, to actually take classes on union organizing, unions, the, labor, the history of the labor movement, and, and in, in a way take classes on issues of uh, workplace uh, justice and also the impact of uh, you know, the low wage workforce. Josh, do you agree in terms of the analogy about business schools compared to labor studies? I mean, is that a legitimate analogy that if we have a business school, why can't we have a, a study of, uh, of labor? Yeah, I mean, I think that sort of on a on a moral basis that you know there should be i mean it and it comes back again to the question of who who has power and what are the trajectories of power and so when you think about unions you know it, it affects everyone i mean you may you may see yourself in a in a trajectory you know you may see that i'm going to be a highly skilled individual so i'm going to have some market power to bring in uh, a wage but when 
most, um, most people um, who are working have no sort of power to negotiate the terms of their employment or a decreasing power to uh, negotiate the terms of their employment. It really undermines democracy. And so we have a society where with, with the decline in, in unionization, with the decline in organized worker power, there aren't really countervailing forces to, to this concentration of, of wealth, right? Big business, right, even though we have a democracy, right, when it comes election time, people vote based on the ads and based on the information that they're getting, right? The, the, so th there's, there's tremendous influence over the political process and over the, over the spending priorities, right? determined by who, the concentration of, of, of wealth. And, and when workers have power, when they're organized to have power, there's a countervailing force, right? So that you had a, when you, when you had stronger unions, you had more labor studies programs. And one of the reasons that, you know, you ask why UCLA, you know, it's, it's the same reason. LA and Southern California has been one of the places where there's been a real fight, and it's been organized labor and the allies that have fought to have this, this program. Hopefully, Loyola Mar Marymount, with a private funding, can come up with some similar priorities, but okay, I think well, that no, that's we, why. We like corporations, too. The, the Levy Center, we're in the Amundsen Auditorium, we eat at Roski Cafeteria, so... Um, but it doesn't take a... I've been able to help UC Riverside, Occidental College has created their own kind of labor uh, program um, just from scratch. And I think it, all it takes is a few dedicated professors and a group like, of- Like Occidental College with yeah. Peter Dreyer. Yeah. yeah, and a group of committed students. And you create something that eventually gets the attention of uh, labor advocates and then you, sh you build it up. And I think that's the beginning of these kind of programs. So let, let me go back to um, Karina and ask her about her chapter. W what are the major findings? And then maybe uh, uh, Josh and Victor, you can talk about a couple of the other chapters in terms of what were the major findings. Um, you went into, you, st you knew a lot about this already and you were writing, but when, in, in terms of summarize the chapter uh, for us and, and then also tell us what, what were the findings that, that uh, the chapter concludes. Sure. Um, well. Uh, so again, the chapter was on the Maintenance Corporation Trust Fund, which is a janitorial watchdog. Um, and I think one of the things that we really found was um, how important the trust fund uh, does to help put um, a floor under the wages. And so that's one of the major findings that we, we talked about in terms of understanding how that works uh, with regard to, to, to competition. As Josh mentioned, union density is really low, so you had these bigger companies coming in, allowing subcontractors to, to get the bids to hire janitorial workers, um, and they were doing so, at, at the, way, the way they were able to get these bids um, at low contract was because they weren't paying workers fair wages. So the... Start, but the history of, of janitors in LA is they were heavily unionized. It was one of the stronger unions at, at one point. Mm -hmm. And then it gets completely undermined with the process that you're talking about. So this is very unique compared to the rest of the chapters where, where you don't start off, or am I correct, or are there, is there another example of the nine successful campaigns where you had strong unions, then in terms of what your chapter talks about, it, they, they really get undermined. And then this is kind of the rebuilding. It also ties racially with a, the makeup of, of that that you talk about. Right, like this is also sort of on the heels of J4J, the Justice for Janitors campaign that happens here in Los Angeles. And so they're thinking of, okay, if we don't have a high density and, and workers are continuously, and companies that are trying to do a fair wage and unions are trying to pay, pay a fair wage are constantly getting undercut by subcontractors that are willing to submit a bid at low wages, what do we do? So the concept of a trust fund came together, which is have unions um, put money into a fund to hire this janitorial watch that can come in and look in non-union supermarkets and really get a sense of what the labor violation is and hold the big companies accountable. And so, I mean, Victor was really involved in this Albertsons case, but um, basically it was $22 million that was won in the Albertsons case that we talk about here, where finally, um, based on a joint employer theory, um, Albertsons and the bigger supermarkets were, were held accountable. And, and what I mean by joint employer was that what, what they tend to do, and we see these in other industries, is let's say Albertsons hires a subcontractor to, to, then, hi to then work for janitors. They say, well, it's the subcontractor's responsibility um, to pay these janitors a fair wage. We're not responsible. They're not our employers. So what this case really did, and I would argue set precedent, and that's what we talk about in this chapter, is to say there is a relationship. You are the employer, and you should be held accountable. Um, and I think the trust fund is really um, powerful in making that work because 
because they do both, they do, they have the legislative arm and then they have what's sort of like a worker center too is which we what we talk about where it's um, having w former workers, workers who were janitors themselves be do doing the organizing and talking to the janitors and getting them to submit um, claims and then um, doing all of that at the same time I think has really helped um, in uh, setting that case as, as a precedent for the Albertsons case. Um, as well, and so I think other cities, like we t I talk about a person we interviewed in Houston from SEIU, he, they want to set up a trust fund there too because it's impossible to hold these companies accountable if you don't have a watchdog on the ground figuring out how do you make sure that these bigger companies are, are responsible. And the trust fund is money. Where, where does the money come from? Um, it comes from union fees to, to come in to pay for this for this trust fund and so it's to the union's advantage to be able to have these trust funds because they don't want their competitors to undercut them because they're unions they have to pay a fair wage. Um, Does that it also come from uh, um, legal victories? Where you and you're, yes, you're right, correct. Le legal victories as well. So that's part of the way in which the money comes and, in. And how do you, I mean, every single place of business has janitors. Somebody cleans that place up. How do you decide where to go? You, was this uh, this was just about uh, um, supermarkets, but there are, are there efforts in other sectors of the economy? Yeah, and I think and, and Victor can definitely talk more about the J for J campaign. But this was specifically um, Ed Chiklakian, who's the chapter is dedicated to. He really saw the, the the labor rights violations that were happening in the supermarkets and said, "Hey, we really need to we really need to hone in and focus on 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 supermarkets here in Los Angeles." And interestingly enough, it was the emergence of new supermarkets, the old conventional traditional supermarkets that had moved out to the suburbs, left the inner cities. You had a whole new kind of supermarket arrive and you mentioned some of them earlier on that were actually ethnically owned many by Koreans mm -hmm. and Latinos mm -hmm. but who didn't want to be union right. and so that there's that that whole different dynamic speak a little bit to the I mean we celebrated the fact that a Ralph's moved back to downtown uh, but there was re there's really no supermarket other than a Ralph's now in, mm -hmm. in downtown or, or that, that type of area talk about that dynamic of supermarkets leaving and then the 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 role of the the unions Sure. Um, well, I mean, I could speak to sort of in the places that I mentioned, Superior, Food for Less, all those areas are in, um, you know, majority working class communities of color. Um, and we also noticed within that, I mean, here these are supermarkets where people need to get access to food. So there's this interesting link of making sure you do have supermarkets in the area. Um, and then we noticed how people were getting the jobs and a lot of the connections, a lot of people were from Puebla. Um, even when this lawsuit happened and they needed to get claim the $22 million for workers, they had to go to Puebla and get on the, 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 the bullhorn in small towns and say, were you a worker in Los Angeles from this point to this point working at this supermarket? If so, you know, you, you have some, you, you should claim um, money that you have access to because your labor's rights were being violated. So I think too, within that, within, you know, some of these stores that were, that's, that were Korean, Korean owned and or within working class communities, you also had this sort of social networking that was happening of who was getting access to, to the jobs and people coming all the way from Puebla because their cousin um, was, 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 uh, had a job that they could offer and then it created problems and I talk about this in my, my chapter as well that one person, his, you know, his brother-in-law was his boss and so when he called out against the labor rights violations it put him in a, a really precarious situation with his family so much so that he had to leave but I think those were also the intentions of the subcontracting co companies, you know, have your family members involved because you're less likely to speak out against them and they know how those networks are working in those strengths. Um, Victor, I'm going to ask you about the justice for janitors, and then I want to ask Josh about the history of labor unions, because we, we keep, and Josh has mentioned several times how the epicenter of new, organizi new organizing is happening here in Los Angeles, but really the history of Los Angeles has been very anti-union, and, and it's kind of a surprising, 30 years ago, if you were to say it was going to happen here, people would have told you there, there's no way. But before I do that, I want to make it a little bit relevant to the, um, the students, because obviously Loyola Marymount University, we have janitors, okay? And in 1999, when we bought this building, there was a decision made that the janitors for this building and the rest of this part of the campus would not be LMU employees, that we would contract out. And in fact, we contracted out to the lowest bidder. And quickly, you had a two-tier uh, group of janitors, those that were up on the upper campus, 
who were, had all the benefits and had much higher wages, had tuition remission for themselves and their, uh, and their um, families, as opposed to the janitors who were here, who could be rotated in and out, who had much lower wages, who had no other rights. And it was students who took action and on behalf of the uh, uh, janitors here, uh, um, we're able to get the, that system uh, um, changed. Now, there's still issues in all that, and I'm actually going to put a, a couple of students uh, uh, in the spotlight and ask them to talk when it comes to the student section who, were, who helped organize, and some of the sledge representatives are, are here in this class who organized and got the uh, janitors to be uh, uh, LMU employees instead of, instead of contractors. But it all began with really justice for janitors. Most janitors, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, were African American and unionized. Those unions, to some extent, got busted. And then there was a new reemergent, and they were replaced, and let's be honest, there was, they were replaced by Latinos, mostly Mexican, that undermined the wages of African American union workers. And, they, and, and um, Mexican workers were used to undermine African American workers. Once that was established, though, Mexican workers realized what was happening and then began this whole process and picked that up with the... Uh, do I have my facts correct in There's terms of... There's a couple uh, of factors input? I want to add. It. I think the, the industry was already going through a different arrangement when, um, when it was still a larger African-American workforce. I mean, there, uh, building, buildings were going to uh, look at subcontractors as a way to to cut costs and, and sell them higher in the workers, they will hire subcontractors, and then the subcontractors will keep the wages so low that you saw that the flight of African Americans from the industry, then they were being replaced by uh, mostly Mexican workers. But during the 1980s, you saw then more uh, Central American worker, uh, workers coming to this country. They were fleeing the wars, and was, uh, some of you are too young to remember this, but during the wars in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras, they were f coming to this country. and. Those Salvadoran workers, there was already a, a sense of militancy with the Mexican workers, but those Salvadoran workers, many of them were union organizers themselves in their countries, and they came with that spirit of organizing. I mean, they organized uh, under the threat of being killed in the country. So they came here as janitors, and they started to really reinvent this union. SEIU had actually had given up on Ma unionizing. Let them know what's SEIU. The Service Employee International Union actually gave up on organizing the industry because they thought it was really not worth organizing. But from that struggle came out a more militant local of SEIU, which is 1877. They felt that with this new, new newly arrived immigrant that came with a strong spirit of organizing, they could go back and organize this industry with the right strategy. So the strategy was to pressure the building owners, the building property managers who hired these contractors, who hired, to hire contractors who will agree to unionization, union contracts. So let, let's so. be clear here. So you have someone owns a building, then they hire somebody to manage the building, then that person who manages the building hires somebody, a company, to come in and clean it. And so that the owner is three or four steps removed from the decision in terms of who's cleaning the building and always says, hey, I'm not the one doing it, it's somebody else. Yeah, so the only way to create responsibility was to pressure these property owners, uh, these building owners. Many of them are very affluent individuals. They have uh, many ways to connect them to elected officials, to pressure them to so many different ways. This campaign started in 1990. It took 10 years before the major strike in 2000, the major really fight for the justice for janitor. But it was 10 years of re-strategizing, looking at the right way to develop the right research strategy, to uh, develop the great, uh, right organizing strategy. And um, you know, when they won the major strike in 2000, it really unionized most of the downtown buildings and, and a lot of the West LA, uh, West LA buildings. But the MCTF became an important model because it became the watchdog to go after the subcontractors. They were still trying to undermine union wages. So that way uh, you can get rid of these subcontractors, put them out of business or go after them for labor violations and force them into compliance. It, it really uh, strengthens their union density in the, in the industry. Joshua, unions in L.A., historically very anti-union town. Then in the 50s, you get very different kind of unions, mo almost white-collar kind of this aerospace industry comes to mind, and, and auto workers, and, and, and you talked about oh, a high degree of unionization in some of those sectors, but they didn't seem to be the type that were organizing 
low wage workers and didn't particularly care about them. Speak about that uh, history. Well, I, I, I'm, um, I think that the J for J discussion, the Justice for Janitors discussion here, and some of the issues that actually Karina, Victor, and Fernando have all laid out actually provide a good framework for understanding why LA has been a place where the labor movement has really be, been reborn and how, and what you know, really our key findings were for the book overall. So let me, let me sort of start with justice for janitors, broaden it a little bit to security, and um, then sort of I, I, Is justice for janitors? I mean, I always use it as that's the, the key point, the, the thing that changes. Is there something before that? There's a symbolically, I mean, I, I think that symbolically it is the important sort of you know nationally you know recognized sort of moment where things come together. But um, there's there's some of these approaches earlier, and I think you know the the point that you were making about sort of these layers of employment is crucial for also understanding why union density has fallen apart generally, and why the laws are really set up to prevent workers from building power. Right. So if you have you know, 50 years ago, a building owner is, is hiring a janitor, right? Then that janitor and the other janitors that work in the building can say, we need to be paid, you know, at least enough money to put food on our table for our children in order to clean the buildings, right? And there's someone that they're talking to who has control over that employment relationship that they can negotiate with. When the janitors are hired by subcontractors who are hired by the building manager who's hired by the building owner, and the building owner really is not using their own money anymore, but is in fact beholden to large financial institutions who are looking at where the best investment is, then let's say that the workers do the impossible and they convince the subcontractor, yes, we need to unionize, we're going to raise wages. Well, the building manager says, forget it, we're hiring a different subcontractor. Let's say that together, you know, the workers are able to convince the building manager to go union and to pay a living wage, then the building owner fires the building manager and hires another one because their costs go up too much. Let's say that you win at the level of the owner, right? and the owner says, okay, I will have unions in my building, then finance says, you know, you're not bringing in enough profit. Say finance, as you mean the lenders or the, the, lenders. the equity firm that owns the yes. building or gave the owner the money. And over the last 30, 40, 50 years, the structure of the economy has been greatly financialized. And all these levels of subcontracting so that the employment relationship has been marketized. So a way to think about this is that there's a separation of management and control. The people who manage the employment relationship, who hire the workers, do not have control over the employment relationship. And so what's happened is, is it's become very difficult, if not impossible, for the worker to fight the person who actually directly employs them and to win some kind of living wage. Because who has the power of the management of the employment relationship is nowhere to be found. It's often not clear who those people are. And how to apply pressure on them is not at all clear. So what's happened in that context is that where labor, and again, Right, we have to put this in context. I don't want to sound like I'm saying that the rebirth of labor in LA has really turned the game around, because it hasn't. Un private sector union density is below 7%, and it's continuing to decline. Right? But what has happened in LA, and a few other places, and with a few unions in particular, is that they've figured out, some workers and worker organizers and worker organizations have figured out how to fight in this new context. Figured out ways of figuring out who does have the control and how to apply pressure on them. Now in cities like New York, where you had large levels of unionization, you had a labor bureaucracy that was not that able to change and fight in these new ways. And didn't have necessarily the incentive. In LA, in part, and there's other reasons as well, and you know, there's a lot of different arguments about exactly why Ruth Milkman makes some in her LA storybook, to, um, but the, there was a lack of strong bureaucracy, and there was also a fertile ground of community organizations trying to address workers' issues from a different vantage. And what really developed in LA was a cross-fertilization, if you will, between traditional labor organizations and community organizations. Community organizations that had strong roots and constituencies in communities that were being affected, the communities of workers, right? And um, part of the challenge, right, so just to bring this back to, to the separation of management and control and, um, uh, in a few words, part of the challenge 
right, of overcome, of getting at who really has control over the employment relationship, is that the law says you can't. The law says if you are a labor organization, you can only fight for challenges to the employment relationship. You can only fight your legal employer. And your legal employer doesn't have much power these days. So the law actually prevents, it's like a boxing match where the worker is fighting the bosses and the worker has their hands tied behind their back by the law. And so the community groups, and this was, this was what was really brilliant about Justice for Janitors, was that the pressure that was applied on the janitorial contractors and on the building owners was not applied in traditional ways by the labor union just going after the direct employer. It was implied by a vast community mobilization because through free speech, there was the ability for the community groups to stand up and fight and say, hey, we're going to pressure and we're going to shut down and we're going to stop business as usual and we're going to make it impossible for the building owners to continue going about doing their normal business. If the workers had been doing the same thing, it would have been a violation of labor law. And but who were some of those allies? Well, some of those allies are many of the groups that Victor has been involved with. Let me, um, let me tell you more specifically, in a, uh, if, if I have a, let me tell you more specifically in, in security unionization, um, which built on the justice for janitors. And it's a very, it's, 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 let me bring it to a slightly different realm and to sort of flesh out the story a little bit, which is in, in security unionization, unlike janitorial, security officers had never been unionized in Los Angeles. Right? And you think of security as, you know, people wearing uniforms, maybe they're highly skilled. The reality was most security officers in downtown commercial office buildings are paid minimum wage and they have no employment rights, no job st security, no stability. They're basically warm bodies there to make the tenants of the, of the office buildings feel secure. And what, what happened in that fight, and I won't go into details. If you want to know more, ask me and we'll go into it in the question and answers. But the union built a partnership with black community organizations. And some of the important leaders were folks like um, James Lawson, who was Martin Luther King's right hand, helped to bring nonviolence from Gandhi into the civil rights movement, created the Tennessee Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and w actually organized the Memphis garbage worker strike, for example, where King was killed. Folks like this got involved in mobilizing black community organizations to say, hey, these building owners are perpetuating the legacy of slavery. They, you know, at this point, they're paying the white engineer. The white engineers in these buildings have unions. At this point, the, the janitors had unions, largely Mexican and Latino immigrants had, had unions. The black security officers in the same buildings didn't have unions, and the, the, the building owners were very, very resistant. And so it was the black community organizations that mobilized and fought and, and were able to put pressure um, to make it impossible for the building owners to continue a life as usual. One last example, a key turning point in the campaign, um, Robert McGuire, the largest building owner in downtown LA, was going to Australia for a multi-billion dollar loan and had, had, was in process for finalizing a multi-billion dollar loan for reconstruction in downtown LA. James Lawson and other community leaders were on the drive time radio, front page of the main Australian paper, talking about plantation capitalism in Los Angeles and the racism of the downtown building owners. And all of a sudden, ministers of parliament were calling the banks in Australia saying, you know, something's going on here. And the bank said, hey, McGuire, you've got to straighten out this race problem in LA if you want to go ahead with this project. And that's when he called the union. That's what won. That was a key turning point with mobilization of black community organizations in the streets in LA, coupled with pressure internationally provided by the black community organizations that won unionizations, living wage, health benefits, 40% pay increase, contracts and job security for 5,000 predominantly black security officers in Los Angeles for the first time ever. Who were some of the other allies, Victor? Well, um, many of the groups featured in this book were involved in some of these coalition efforts to support these campaigns. And I think when you read the book, one of the common threads is LA has really become, a, I think, a good model for coalition building between you know, some of these worker centers and the immigrant rights organizations, uh, getting involved with these campaigns, helping uh, support these workers' organizing efforts, but also uh, interfaith groups. Um, you know, we have uh, strong interfaith coalitions in Los Angeles. And I want to go back into the mid-1990s, because I think it's an important moment in history in labor in Los Angeles. It, 
you know, the, the AFOCL, the way it's structured, you have central labor councils in every major city. And these are central labor councils like the umbrella organizations of all the local unions. And Los Angeles has the largest one, the LA County Federation of Labor is the largest central labor council. And in 1995... So, wait, wait, just to be clear for the students. So, when you talk about unions, there's all kinds of different unions. Yeah. And there's building trade unions, and even within building trades, there's the carpenters, the mm -hmm. electricians, the plumbers. And so you divide them up all into this different work, and then even within that, you divide them in geographically. Yeah. So okay. there's 25, for example, there's 25 uh, construction trade unions. Right. Um, you also have unions represent workers in the supermarkets, um, the janitors, um, home care workers through the county, um, uh, uh, the in-home supported services uh, program ha uh, are unionized. But in 1995, it was a historic election in the LA County Federation of Labor. The this is the umbrella group that brings them all together. Yeah. So the executive secretary treasurer was like the president of the federation. Um, the first ever person of color was elected, uh, Miguel Contreras. And it was historic because Miguel, I think, reached out to um, the immigrant workers because he saw immigrant workers really becoming uh, changing the demographics of a lot of these industries, and he reached out to immigrant workers and integrated them into the labor movement, and that created, I think, the foundation for some of the great hotel worker organizing that you read about in this uh, book, laid the foundation for uh, the coalition building that you needed for to make like the Justice for Janitor campaign successful. It changed, what was happening in Los Angeles changed the AFO-CIO's policy on immigration, because when you think in 1986, the last time we had an amnesty program in this country, we also had uh, the beginnings of strong employer sanction laws, which made it hard for anybody who was not authorized to work in this country to get good jobs. And the labor movement completely changed its perception on immigration and immigrants in general, not seeing them as outsiders or threats, but seeing them as the future of labor in this country. And I think a lot of that was highlighted by uh, the stuff that was going on in Los Angeles, especially the Justice with Janitors campaign, because right after that the strike with the janitors, it was not too long right afterwards that the AFL-CIO completely changed its policy and started supporting comprehensive immigration reform, which up until then, we, we never really thought the immigrant rights movement, the labor movement, labor movement would ever work together for new immigration reform in this country. So I think Miguel Contreras becoming, taking over the leadership role, the first person of color to do that in mid-1990s, I think, created the landscape that was possible for some of the major organizing campaigns. I mean, he was an, not only was he Latino, but he was a farm worker who started with Cesar Chavez and was one of his main organizers who, I think at the age of 20, was sent with $20 to Toronto, Canada and said, go organize. And he, they bought him a plane ticket, gave him $20, and gave him a couple of names and said, go organize. And that's... Uh, he, he was as young as you guys are right here, and he, w he was very, very successful in terms of doing that. Another key point that Victor just made is it's hard for us to understand now d today, but it, it, it's not on unions were against uh, immigrant rights because they believed that the more immigrants you had, the more they would undermine unions and union workers because they would bring down uh, the, the, um, the wages and, and the benefits. And so they, they were not for immigration reform and legalizing those immigrants that were here. They were very much for employer sanctions, and some would even label them being a little bit anti-immigrant. So it was historic when yeah. um, Miguel Contreras was not only the first Latino elected, not only from the UFW and Cesar Chavez organization, but also very pro immigrant pro-Latino, and he changed that, that around. Go ahead, And Victor. then today, the Air Force CIO actually, three years ago, adopted a worker center partnership. So today, the Air Force CIO has strong partnerships with the National Day Labor Organizing Network, with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, which is the, uh, U which is the national uh, coalition of worker centers and the restaurants, have a partnership with the Air Force CIO. I mean, this stuff, it's important because it, I mean, when I came to Los Angeles, started doing work with immigrant workers, I never thought, I thought it would be many, many years before you could have uh, something like a partnership between the Air Force CIO and the National Day Labor Organization. You, you thought you'd get old and have gray hair by the time that yeah. would happen, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Karina, so now, l let me ask you, 
more of a career decision that you've made. You were working at UCLA, you got your MA, you helped with this uh, chapter, but now you're the Community Outreach Coordinator for the LA Conservancy. How did that come about? What do you do there? Sure. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why I got so interested in this position uh, at the Conservancy is through doing this, working on this book project and working at the Institute uh, for Social Change Across Borders. Um, my role as Community Outreach Coordinator for the Los Angeles Conservancy, so I work with Latino, and, uh, Latino communities um, to help save places that matter f to them. And I think and, and it's understanding the history of Los Angeles, understanding the neighborhoods um, that has really gotten me ex so excited about this position. Um, and I'll give you an example example, two examples just to give you a sense of sort of how it transitioned in because for me urban planning and Latin American studies and working at the labor center I, I had a sense of who the organizations were and what Los Angeles neighborhoods are about and I'm learning more but I do work in Boyle Heights um, with a group of residents of the Wyvernwood Garden apartment complex so it's um, 7,000 residents that live there it's uh, the largest um, uh, the first uh, and the largest uh, garden apartment complex to be built here in Los Angeles built in 1939 um, the residents are currently uh, it's currently being threatened with demolition so the owners want to go in and um, demolish the site and put in four times the density um, have that be contacted dominiums and commercial use. So it would ultimately and essentially kick out the residents. And so what we're arguing is this is an, this is an architecturally significant place, but it's also culturally significant because the residents have made that the, the case. It was, um, it was designed to foster community and that's what they've done. Um, so I think those are the times in which, you know, hearing f directly from communities and community organizing and building stronger coalitions around how do we, how do we protect a place that really means something to the residents um, in Wyvernwood, to Boyle Heights, and to Los Angeles as a whole, who's getting pushed out, who gets to stay, what's important, what matters, what doesn't. Um, we're also working to put uh, self-help graphics on the California Register of Historic uh, Places as well. Um, and self-help graphics, I think some of you might be familiar with, um, is uh, 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 the building itself um, was originally the Catholic Youth Organization that served as a community center for folks in East Los Angeles. It transitioned into um, the birthplace of Chico Chicano and Chicano art um, in terms of political graphics, Dia de los Muertos, all these different um, festivals that are coming that came out of there and it's also an incredible public art piece and so um, it's currently on the market could be could be potentially in the future also slated for demolition you know we're, we're not sure so again it was working with communities to say how do we how do we actually save these places that have it's without the people it hasn't you know that's what makes it vibrant it makes it come alive so um, again I think doing that type of work I'm, I'm, I'm in different neighborhoods all over also in Westlake working in different places in Westlake and Pico Union um, but a lot of what you said in the beginning was you know how do we sort of flip what has been assumed and perceived as historic preservation to be more of a community base that reflects the history that oftentimes doesn't get um, put within, you know, the quote-unquote master narrative of what, what the history is or, or what a place is or what's valuable. Um, how do we work with community members to really save these cultural significant How many sites? of you know of Wyvernwood or Bo where Boyle Heights is? It's like, um, and uh, wow. who, who, who currently owns it? Uh, 15 Group currently owns it, and it's a $2 billion proposed project. Um, so they've on, on the one hand, urban plan planners like yourself want density. On the other hand, you want to be able to protect something of, the, of this nature. So you have conflicting principles that, that come into place. But certainly you can have density in new areas or where uh, land isn't already being used for housing. Um, we have plenty of uh, vacant uh, industrial land and, and uh, um, parking lots throughout downtown in different areas. So the 15 group is who? Uh, it's a developer that's based out of Miami, headquartered in Miami. So they have different um, uh, projects throughout the nation. Um, I think they were quoted in an um, article uh, s saying that this was a home run for the slums. So that I think that they thought was that they could run into Boyle Heights, steamroll over an immigrant community that they felt probably didn't have a lot of voice and power in land use decisions, and that they were going to get approved the entitlements right away and be able to go and build in. It's right by the gold line as well. So, I mean, close to it, a transit oriented adjacent. Um, and so again, I think they're thinking, what are the changes that are happening in Boyle Heights, and how do we get we how do we get a piece of those changes in that sense? So, um, Joshua, talk to us about another one of the chapters. Uh, I, I don't want to say your favorite, but uh, w which one uh, uh, you, did you think was the, the more surprising in terms of how it, it evolved and the findings that that uh, came out of it? Well, there's um, 
It's hard to pick a favorite, so I'll just pick one that comes to mind. I mean, I think um, that's a real contrast. Um, I think both, you know, in our discussion of J4J and the security unionization campaign, these are union um, heavy campaigns. I think one of the chapters um, that's, that's really, um, I think, important about an important and impressive campaign um, is about the day laborers, and um, Victor mentioned them earlier. Um, but what the day laborers have really done is find a whole new way of organizing workers outside of a union framework, right? So, so union density has declined. There are challenges to organizing unions in the same way. And if you think about day laborers, you can see all the reasons that, that it would be so hard, right? Who, who, who knows? I mean, we've, we've talked about it, but who's, who's clear what a day laborer is? People are mostly clear, right? It's, if you go to Home Depot, right, and there's people who might be running up to your car saying, you know, hey, I'll work for you. They don't look day. very organized when they're running up to the car. <laughs> Those ones aren't very organized, right? The ones that are running up to the car may not be that, all that organized. Um, those are day laborers, and, and a lot of times day laborers may go and they may work a day, and then they're not paid at the end of the day, right? The, the person who hired them says, okay, thank you, bye, right? And, and many day laborers don't have, um, you know, status for working, right? So they may be very vulnerable to, you know, what are they going to do? You know, are they going to sue the, the person who employed them? Can they even, you know, how can they track even who it was? There's no sa safety and health protection, right? So somebody's working on a roof and they fall off and they break their, you know, leg or let's say they break their back, who's going to take care of the kids, right? Um, there's no protection, right? So now let's say that those day laborers want to go and they want to hold the employers accountable. And let's say, okay, we're going to organize a union. Well, who's the employer? Right? By labor law, the way it's written, right, which is against the way that most work actually happens in this economy, right? You've got to organize with the employer, right? But the employer is just somebody who happened to pick you up for the day, right, and pay you for a day of work. So it's not, it's, it doesn't, you know, there's no workplace. There isn't a, a group of workers that could organize a union to, you know, go and uh, get a contract with John Smith, who you happen to just work for for one day, right? So what Endelon did is they created, um, coming out of two different strands, coming out of um, work that was being done by Chirla and um, an organization that was mentioned earlier, and also work that was been being done by Adepska, they combined two kinds of community organizing to create a new model of building worker power for day laborers. And one, one of those models was a stakeholder model, and this comes from Chirla, where Chirla had been doing different work where they said, okay, there's, a, there's an issue in the neighborhood. We can bring together different stakeholders and try to figure out a solution that works for everyone. Right? So, so for the day laborers, it turned out there were a lot of other people who were upset about how day labor was working, other than the workers themselves. The local stores didn't like having people out front fighting and you know, having alcohol and litter and these kinds of things. The police didn't like it. The community organizations didn't like it. So there were other potential stakeholders for actually changing the situation. And Chirla had experience working with different groups and getting them to come together to a common solution. Adepska had been doing something called popular education. Who, who here has heard of Paulo Freire? A few people. Um, he's, uh, he was a Brazilian um, scholar activist who really pioneered a method of education through working with the issues that people are facing, the oppression and the concerns that people are facing, and using that as the basis of education and of organizing. And Adepska had mastered working with different communities to really draw out the issues that they were facing and use that as a basis for education. So Adepska and the popular education model came together with Chirla and they said, we can, and, and this wasn't just an idea, it developed over time, and if you read the chapter, it'll lay it out, you know, blow for, for blow, but, but this was really the insight, was that you could combine popular education with bringing these different stakeholders to the table, and you could organize a corner where instead of workers just fighting each other to who would get first to the car and undermining, you know, okay, if you'll, if you'll go for $10 an hour, I'll, be, I'll work for eight and Victor's going to work for six, right? They would say, okay, here's what it costs to hire somebody to paint. 
here's what it costs to hire somebody to do roofing. Here's what it costs to hire somebody to work on, you know, glazing on windows, right? Here's what it costs to hire a carpenter. Here's what it costs to hire an electrician. And here's the order in which people arrive today and which they will get to work. And people are accredited to be able to do a certain kind of work. So we're going to work together. And they brought in the Home Depots and they brought in the local businesses and they brought in the police and they worked out these arrangements and organized corners so that if you go to those particular corners, now instead of having 10 million people swamp you and no protection, they take down your license plate, there's some accountability, and there's a standard. And this model has now spread across the whole country and become a model for how day laborers can organize. And it's being used in, I think, 100 cities throughout the country. Started here in LA. And some of these have been legitimized in that you actually have a space at the parking lot. I mean, the best one that I know of is the Home Depot on Wilshire and uh, Whitmer that, uh, th that, that they have it organized that way. Doesn't mean that every single day laborer participates, uh, but there's clearly a consensus uh, that they're not going to work for less than $10 an hour. And, and you can see when people go and try to hire them and they say, no, I want to pay you less, that nobody else will, will take that work, as desperate as, as, uh, uh, as it becomes. Um, Victor, talk, talk to us about another uh, chapter or another campaign. Uh, <clears throat> there's a great chapter on the Clean Car Wash campaign. And you know, the, the, the car wash industry, uh, there's been a major organizing effort that started three years ago. Um, by the Air Force here in the United States workers. It's the first attempt in many years, especially here in Los Angeles, to organize a new industry that's never been organized by labor. But that campaign actually goes back 10 years prior to that day. So when you read the chapter, it, you know, the beginning of the chapter is the launching of the campaign, but it really goes back to the 10 years it took. It's a great way to show the role of students and what's, how students can come up uh, with the uh, documentation and the research process to create a campaign. Because uh, before the AFOCI and the United States Workers launched the campaign in 2008, it was really uh, almost 10 years of work, of my work with either law students, uh, UCLA students, not all from UCLA. You know, I had students from different campuses uh, working with me, doing either uh, surveying different car washes or trying to research the industry, document the labor violations, all this documentation by the students, uh, uh, we were able to create a legislative bill to um, to pass a law in California that will regulate the car wash industry. You know, the, when I mean regulate, I mean the uh, car wash employees, so they have to register with the state of California. They have to get a permit to do business in California. And we use the registration to get more information about these employers, this public information. All the accumulation of the information by many years of students, uh, we came to a point where, uh, because the Air Force CIO was reaching out to worker centers, we brought them to Los Angeles to look at the opportunity of maybe looking at the car wash industry as the first attempt to organize a new industry. Um, it was predominantly immigrant workers. And um, the campaign was launched, but it was really the data, the resor resource collection, the documentation by all the students over the years that really, we did all the research for the unions to show them the viability of this industry for organizing. And since then, we've had a great campaign. It's been a tough campaign because you're organizing mostly family-owned businesses. There's no subcontract. It's most, and you know, my experience is, is the, sometimes the worst employers to fight against could be the family-owned employers, be, businesses, because they fight to the bitter end. There's no such thing as a low-hanging fruit in this industry. They'll fight. They'll put up any, everything they can before they... Um, uh, before they agree to any any collective bargaining or any organized um, any organization among the employees, but it's been a great fight. A lot of students have been involved. Students continue to be involved. But the cap the chapter really sh shows the anatomy of how you know lawyers working with students, uh, undergraduate students, the research these students have done led to the creation of this campaign. So it's a good. Um, chapter for students to read about how, as a student, you can make a difference in, in the organizing effort. But it hasn't been successful. We're close, you know. We've been at this campaign for three years, and we're close to getting our, our first union agreement with, in consultation with a big employer. So it takes a while. When you, when you enter first into an, organized, uh, an organizing campaign, an industry that's never been organized, you have no union employer to create a density or to compare uh, standards with so we had to start from scratch and we had to first improve labor standards because there were no car wash workers making minimum wage but today because of all the labor uh, um, enforcement that we've introduced into this campaign 
the constant uh, lawsuits, but also bringing in the administrative agencies to enforce the laws. We have more car wash workers earning minimum wage today, so we kind of cap the the, the um, you know the, we kind of uh, put a cap on the exploitation, and now we at least have uh, a standard to work with. And we're very close. I mean, there's a couple of employers that are in consultation with the Air Force CIO. So hopefully, in the next few months, we can have the first uh, union agreement. Uh, Karina, what makes a good organizer? Um, that's a great question. Um, that's the only kind of questions <laughs> I ask. Uh, and this one's for me, huh? Um, I, I, I instinctively, instinctively I mean, I think let, that's... Let me, let me start the other way. I was going to ask you this question a second. Who are the three best organizers that you know in L.A.? <laughs> well, one sitting right, right next to uh, me. Yeah, that's like... Sure. Um, uh, well, you know, I, I do think that um, an incredible organizer... Hi, Victor. Who are the other three? Uh, an incredible... And Josh. Don't, don't and Josh, too. Because <laughs> Josh just broke it all down. That's a really good organizer when you can explain everything and ask people questions. Um, I think another one, you know, back to what I was saying about, about uh, Wyvernwood as an incredible organizer is the, the president of El Comité de la Esperanza, Leonardo Lopez. I mean, they've been doing um, organizing in their neighborhood for 26 years. Okay, now, what makes them good? What makes them good is the dedication. It's the door knocking it's the sitting down it's the having having a cup of coffee with family members and caring about about them and um, what they're going through and knowing that you have that you know that they'll su that you'll support them beyond maybe whatever their own uh, agenda is and I think it's listening I think when you ask that question instinctively I think it's listening and it's understanding the nuances um, the the ability to, to negotiate and also to be clear about um, the, your your toolkit and what you can bring and how to how to move things forward Forward. But I think that um, integrity uh, and transparency is also something I think that makes for a really good good organizer. And how do you build trust? And how do you t how do you build partnerships? How do you take horizontal approaches to the work? Because if you're having a top down way of organizing all the time, I mean, we can argue that those work uh, on some levels. But I also think that a horizontal approach empowers community members themselves to be able to also be right there. And I think another major or point for an organizer is to lead by p creating other leaders. Um, you know, if you're, at the, if you're at the top always trying to make all these decisions, how are you building your base and how are you building other leaders to go out and continue to do this work? Um, because at some point you're going to have to pass the baton or share it. Um, and I think that's what makes for powerful organizing when you're able to do those things. So you mentioned one. Who, who's your two other favorite uh, organizers? Um, another one is Katy Ortega. Okay, we're we're, ta we're taping this and we're going to show everybody. So go ahead. Um, Katy Ortega. She's uh, she used to be the former president for the William Mead um, uh, Public Housing, and I work with William Mead too. We're going to be doing oral history project um, with them, and hopefully with uh, uh, LA Commons to do a mural in the neighborhood. Um, again, uh, what makes her strong is I've seen how she works with youth. Youth look up to her, and she has youth um, being at the forefront of, of of speaking about what they care about and what they want and what their needs are. She's, we've come to we've gone to City Hall and testified together as well, and she's always bringing it back to the community base. What are the needs of the community? And she's dedicated, you know, through various trials and tribulations that she's had with her family. She's there and, and completely dedicated. So, so she's um, she's another one. Um, uh, and then also, I'd actually have to say that um, a friend of mine, uh, Daniel French, he's a he's a community organizer with um, with youth in MacArthur Park, and again. Um, he, his way of organizing is he allows other leaders to be leaders. He allows youth to say what they want, what their needs are. He can help negotiate that path, but again, he sort of allows them to shine. And I've seen that transformation. We've done some work together um, at the Miguel Contreras High School, actually, around the history of Westlake, um, what the, how does culture shape the built environment, um, and again, how do you make history today? Um, in doing the organizing and the work that, that you're doing. So I've seen him be an, an effective person simply by, by stepping back. And then also, I think that the other great thing about an organizer is your ability to connect everyone. How do you connect and how do you network? And we've seen this clearly in, in this book. How do these coalitions form? How do you bring different people together? Um, and, and there's strength and there's power in, in, in doing that. Josh, kind of the same question, but a little twist to it. If I am a... 20 to 21 year old LMU student, going to graduate in a year or two, and I want to become a community organizer. What should I be doing now 
and then what should I do immediately upon graduation? Um, well, I mean, at first, I just want to amplify and, and, um, and build on what Karina said about what makes a good organizer. I want to correct one thing. I, I'm not an organizer anymore. I used to be. Um, you got fired? Yeah, I got fired. I did, and I decided that, you know, I had a particular sort of uh, utility to, to play an intellectual role. One of the things that's true about organizers, you know, if, if, you, if you want an easy life, don't become an organizer. I, I'm, I'm not trying to scare anyone away. I'm asking you the question to try to mobilize <laughs> kids who want to be there, and the first thing you say is like... It's not easy work. Uh, now, the path that I've chosen isn't easy either. I, I work very, very hard also. But, um, you know, when I was an organizer, I was putting in 80-hour weeks consistently for years and years and years and years. And Victor puts in, uh, well, Lorene can probably tell us better than, <laughs> but uh, Victor, from my knowledge, puts in 80 hours most weeks or more also. Um, and, but it sounds but like he needs a union to get some he uh, does better work union. hours. But the payoff is great, right? It's, there's no way in this world to live as true to your heart as working with people to really address the needs that they have pressing on them every day. And that's what, a, that's what an organizer does day in and day out, and that's why an organizer works 80 hours a week. And um, I think that, um, you know, Cesar Chavez said, you know, almost exactly what Karina when you saying, right, which is that, you know, the job of an organizer is to put yourself out of work, right? It's to find, it's to find the, the, the potential. You can't, you can't change the world as an individual. You can't have an impact on the world as an individual just by doing things yourself. If you're trying to move all the dirt with your own shovel, you're never going to get anything done. And what an organizer does is an organizer finds the fire and the spark in other people and helps them to feed that fire and helps them to address the problems that they're facing by coming together, right? So if, if you want to do that, if you want to be an organizer, the best thing to do is to find someone who you recognize that in, is to find Victor or to find, you know, uh, John O'Shafer or to find uh, Maria Elena Dorasso or to find um, a Lola Smallwood Cuevas or to find somebody who's doing the kind of work that you feel like is really important in the world. You know, you go to these classes and people are telling you a lot of information and there's jobs out there where you can work for a boss who, you know, probably you may not care that much about the things that you're doing, right? A lot of people are working to, to make money, to bring home, to feed their families, which we have to do, right? I don't know if she's here. My daughter, you know, Hannah is here somewhere. I think she might be out, out in the hall, she, uh, my four-year-old. Running the cameras. I think. She's running the cameras, you know. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. Um, but, you know, we, we have to put food on the table, you know, for our families. Um, but... Um, Organizers are, are privileged in um, being able to do something much more than that. They have dedicated their lives, and oftentimes it's hard, to fighting for what's important and to doing that with their day and to doing that with their night. And um, the way to do it and the way to find out how to do it, you, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Find somebody who's doing what it is that you care about. Find somebody who's doing what it is that you care about and go work with them. You know, start as a volunteer. You know, take the $20 and go to, you know, Toronto, but with somebody's guidance. Find somebody who you see doing what it was. And that's how I became an organizer. You know, I found someone um, who had that spark. You know, I knew... That. Uh, that's a long story. Do you want me to tell that story? Um, I, I had been a, I had been a long-time student organizer. I had done a lot of student organizing. Um, and I um, had done some rural organizing and some work in Acorn, and I, I found um, a, a guy, very unusual, you know, not who I would have thought sort of knew what it was that I needed to, to understand, but I, I had some sense of what it was to work with people and bring them together, and I found this guy, Mohammed Nuru, um, in the Bay Area, who was using this nonprofit sort of um, garden organization framework, but he was using it to organize public housing in this very unusual way. And what he was doing was he knew how to relate to guys on the street. He had had his own background in the street, and he had also had his own background in, in development politics. So he knew two sides of, of, uh, of a puzzle, and he knew how to bring guys together 
and really um, sort of create a, a, a group and a sense of belonging. But he also knew how to go out and win contracts and bring in the money. And what he did is he started competing. What you had in, in this was in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, in public housing. And you had a situation where um, most, of the, um, most of the public housing con construction and, and landscape contracting was done by unions but it was done by racist old boy network white unions from people from out of the neighborhood who would come into the neighborhoods and they would do the work and then it would get torn down the next day because the neighborhood was so upset, right? And, and a lot of the folks in the neighborhood, because the folks in the neighborhood weren't getting the employment. You had these relatively wealthy folks from out of the neighborhood coming into the, so what he had done is he had figured out how to bid for the contracts and how to hire people off the street to do, the, to, to do the work and to come in and to build skill through and was paying prevailing wages and building, using the, the construction contracting as a basis for community organizing and building um, community power and getting people involved in politics. Um, so I could go on about sort of my involvement in that organization, but the point is there was something that I saw in Mohammed and his relationships with people on the street where he was doing something that a lot of people talk about but don't really succeed in. And um, that was something I was looking for. So that's my advice to the young people in this audience, is if you want to be an organizer, find someone who you see it in. If you know you want to build social justice in this world, but you don't know what it looks like, go find somebody who it looks like and go work with them. We are at Loyola Marymount University talking about working for justice with uh, Joshua Bloom. Uh, Karina Muniz and Victor Naro. Uh, now we have some time for some questions, so who's ever interested can come up here and ask some questions. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to ask one more question while I uh, wait for the long line of those who are really interested in getting a good grade to uh, <laughs> come, come up here. So um, what's the next campaign, Victor? That we, I mean, I wouldn't have foreseen, you know, car wash. I wouldn't have foreseen day laborers. Um, I have a very limited vision, so I'm, trying, I'm having a difficult time well, seeing yeah. who else, uh, what sector, what area do you think will be the next one? One that we haven't even talked about, day, uh, home, um, what do you call it? home day health care workers. I mean, that's a phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, uh, occurrence. Right now, I'm looking at the, um, the uh, um, valet parking industry. It's a huge industry in Los Angeles. I mean, it's just about some strips of restaurants uh, in the city where you go on a, any particular night you see large amounts of different valet companies with the workers parking your cars and then some of the major buildings now use valet um, hotels and some of the major buildings. Uh, the Teamsters have been organizing that industry in other major cities and they want to explore the possibility of a big campaign in Los Angeles. So. I'm, I'm, you know, trying to uh, connect them with graduate student researchers, undergraduates, to start looking at this industry. I think that's a, that could be a good campaign. The city council wants to pass an ordinance to regulate some. There was a, a recent expose on NBC News about some of the shady practices by some of these owners and people's, uh, you know, what they do to your cars that you don't know about. So there's some parts of the industry that we need to get rid of in LA. But then there's a some companies that dominate the industry, I think we need to look at for union organizing. And um, so that's one of the uh, more recent efforts. And then, you know, this book is really, when you think about it, it's at least two or three years old because it takes a while to write a book and once it gets published. So there's a lot of part two, so a lot of these campaign works. I mean, the Korean Immigrant Workers Alliance is doing a lot of work in housing now. They kind of shifted it from more worker oriented to issues of housing. Um, the uh, you know, the National Day Labor Organizing Network is involved in the big fight now against the attacks on immigrants. They've been targeted by the anti-immigrant group, so they've changed the nature of their work. Um, there's more and more, um, you know, organizing campaigns that, that the Teamsters and other unions are doing in Los Angeles is not featured in this book. So I think we will have a, you know, there'll be time for another volume of uh, work to be done and, you know, another documentation. I think documentation, it's really the best way to highlight the challenges and the best practices and, and you know, hope, hopefully these stories will influence other organizing efforts around the country. And I just want to say some of our students, you know, we try to, we, we have like two or 300 student interns every year at the 
they go to the downtown labor center either through a, a, a lab, learning service requirements of our classes, which you know offers like students to be placed in organizations or a summer internship program. We also have a three-day student leadership academy that we do every summer, and you know very proud to say like 70% of our students that go through our programs end up being organizers. The other 30% do other just as valuable work. It's not just about organizing. We have the need for, you cannot have a, a successful organizing campaign if you don't have a good research uh, strategy. You really gotta research the industry before you organize it. And I think this book highlights the effectiveness of research as a part of the strategies. A lot of students like to do research work, so we try to find them jobs as, as researchers in the labor movement. A lot of students wanna become lawyers, so I do a lot of work with uh, law student interns. And, the car wash campaign, the, major, the two major labor lawyers in the car wash campaign were my law interns. And they learned about the car wash campaign and, they, and now that the lawyers on the car wash campaign. So at the labor center, we try to figure out students who want to be involved in the movement. Not everybody's an organizer, or not everybody wants to do organizing, but we had such a much need for researchers, people to do policy advocacy, and lawyers. One last comment. We have a bunch of these books here. I'm going to offer them to you for $10, and we can even convince some of them to, uh, to sign them. So uh, let's give them a great uh, thank you. LMU, thank you.